Okay, we are recording. Yes. All right. So when you go to the module for the week, in this case, we have our first week, the uh, um, mini projects will appear here at the very bottom of the module. Uh, in this case, because it's just the first week and we um, still have to go through like the syllabus and all of that other material first, then there won't be a mini project this week. Uh, the academic integrity uh, ver verification quiz is taking the place of that, but it will appear uh, here at the end of the module for each week. Um, should be one mini project uh, per week. About there won't be there should there will not be a mini project uh, during the test week, um, but just about every other week. So. Any other questions? Okay. And I know there is a little bit of a delay. I'm, I'm keeping my eye on chat in case you're still writing. I know that some, some devices are uh, more of a challenge to type on than others. Uh, so I'll keep my eye on chat and answer any questions as they come. Uh, but if there are no other questions, we'll go ahead and get started with the lectures. So. I'm going to use um, this as a digital paper, which I will also upload. Let's see. Which I will also upload to Web Campus along with the lectures. Um, last time I didn't, since we were just going over the syllabus that's already been uploaded. So uh, I think I mentioned this last class, and uh, if not, you can see it in the in the tentative schedule. For this semester, um, this course, we're going through the material in order. So we'll do chapter one, and then chapter two, and chapter three. Uh, that is different from from uh, some previous semesters. I think one or two classes did it last semester, but the majority did not. Uh, but we're we're trying this new ordering. So chapter one in this textbook is on logic and reasoning. All right, let me see here, logic and reasoning. So we'll be going over uh, various things dealing with logic and reasoning in chapter one. Uh, chapter two will be different. Uh, and again, this is, um, this is a broad, broad scope course. So um, we're not going to be covering any specific subject in, in great detail. Uh, it will be in some detail, but not as in-depth as in other, other courses. Um, so uh, the first section, section 1A, uh, which also this is different in this textbook. Uh, this author, uh, in most other math textbooks that I've seen you uh, do 1.1, 1.2, and so on. But this author does 1A, 1B, and so on. So 1A, the author entitles this uh, Living in the Media Age. And I apologize for that. I have a little bit of a delay here while I'm writing. So hopefully that won't be too much of an issue. Living in the Media Age. And here we're going to look at, uh, mostly this section will be focused on um, logical fallacies, but we are going to be going through uh, and looking at uh, some other basic definitions. So the first thing we're going to look at is what is logic? How do we define that mathematically? So logic defined mathematically is the study of the methods and principles and principles of reasoning. So uh, logic is the study of any of the methods and principles of reasoning. So we look at um, how do we reason as human beings? What, um, what kind of things can we prove using an argument and things like that? So 
Uh, the next important thing is an argument. What is an argument? And again, we're defining this mathematically. So an argument mathematically, at least in terms of logic, uh, uses a set of facts or assumptions And uh, this we will call the premise. If there is a single factor assumption we're using, or if we have multiple, uh, the premises of the argument uh, to support, let me scroll down here, to support a conclusion. And again, I apologize, I have a little bit of a delay on this, so it's a little bit of an adjustment. All right. Okay, so an argument consists of uh, one or more facts or assumptions, which we will call the premise or premises. Uh, and then we're using that as evidence to support a conclusion. So the conclusion is what we are arguing for. The statement that we want to convince others uh, is true. And we can always, um, when we are analyzing an argument, we can always uh, analyze it, we can always rewrite the argument in the following way. We can say, what is the first premise? So premise one. All right, let me, let me fix that. Premise one. And we write that out as it is presented in the argument. Then we can say, what is premise Two, and we can write that out to however many premises we have. So let's just use uh, n here, premise n. And we might just have one. So in that case, we'd only have the first line. And then what is the conclusion? And so this is the form we can always uh, rewrite an argument in this way. It will not always be presented in this way. Um, I think in the later sections of chapter one, we will present it in this way, um, but for this first section, we're not. Um, so sometimes, especially with, with uh, the English language and, and I think with most other languages, uh, it's not as exact as, as mathematics as we would like it to be. Um, so sometimes the conclusion can be hidden as either the first sentence or the last sentence or somewhere in the middle, um, but we can always rewrite it in this way. So remember the premises here are the premise if you only have one is the evidence that you are using to convince someone of the statement and the conclusion is what is being argued. That is what you are trying to convince the other person or persons is true. So what you, uh, what is being argued, let's say. And so in general, um, when we are looking at uh, analyzing an argument, um, usually the first thing we want to do is rewrite the argument in this in this form. Um, for the exam, uh, let's say for the exam, unless it states on the problem to write it in this form, you don't have to, but that, um, that can be a helpful step to rewrite it in this way. Um, so just be careful with what, what, is, what is written in the, in the directions for the problem. Uh, but in, in general, what we want to do is to rewrite the argument in this way or to think of the argument in this way. Uh, so even if you're not rewriting it, you should have it structured this way in your, in your head. What is the first premise, second premise, third premise, all the way until you get to the conclusion. And so um, a good first step is to rewrite it in this way if it is not presented in this way. So let's write that down. So to evaluate an argument, Uh, we're going to identify 
the premise or premises, again, we can have multiple premises, but, me, but for some arguments, we might only have one. So identify the premise if we just have one. Uh -huh. And uh, again, I apologize for this. This program is running a little bit smaller, uh, a little bit less efficiently than I would expect it to. Um, Let's see. Well, we have some things in the chat. Uh, mine wasn't scrolling. Oh, that's fine. If you're late, that's that happens sometimes. Uh, the lectures are going to be posted on web campus on on the final page. Everything is running slow. Okay, so it might might be my computer. I'll have to change some some settings here. I wonder if it's uh, I wonder if it's Zoom. Maybe Zoom is having some connectivity and that's slowing everything down. Okay. Well, it, uh, either way, we are. I am recording this, so let me let me finish this statement, uh, and then I'll answer that question. I'll show you uh, where on Web Campus the lectures will be posted. Um, so when we are evaluating an argument, we want to want, we want to identify the premise. Again, if we only have one premise, or the premises, if we have multiple and the conclusion. And again, we're going to remind ourselves that the premise or the premises is the evidence that we're using for our argument. And the conclusion is what we are arguing is, is the statement we want to convince others is a true statement. Okay, uh, so let me, let me jump here in the, let me navigate to the right window here. And let me show you on web campus. Uh, the, the lectures will be printed right here. So when you log into web campus, you should see the, the first module. And there will be multiple modules, I'll be fixing those. Uh, but there will I will always add a page that will say digital lectures for the week. And that's where the video and the notes will be uploaded uh, for that week. Okay, so let's go back to our digital paper. Um, any questions up to this point on any of the material we've covered? Um, no questions, okay. And again, I, I realize that sometimes the, it is, it is uh, there's a little bit of a delay in me asking the question and you hearing it. Uh, so I will keep my eye on the chat um, I believe that is scrolling now. Yes, okay. Uh, and if I see answers, I will answer them as we go along. If I see questions, I'll answer them as I go along. <laughs> I think I'm getting my words mixed up. Okay, so let's go to a fresh paper here. And I apologize, this, it looks like it's positioned a little bit weirdly on your screen, I think, but that is because I have the, uh, when I share screens, I have to have the, um, the chat in its own separate window, which you guys can't see and that, that uh, takes up a portion of the screen. Okay. Um, so we have an idea of what an argument is. Again, we have, uh, a premise or premises that is used as evidence to support a conclusion. What occurs sometimes is what is called a logical fallacy. Um, so a fallacy is an argument in which the conclusion conclusion is not well supported <laughs> uh, i wouldn't phrase it that way uh, the conclusion is not supported by the premise or premises uh, and actually some of these um, some of these fallacies come from uh, the brain structure of human thought, which is 
interesting in, in and of itself. But that's, again, that's beyond the scope of this course. Um, so when you're making an argument, if the uh, premise or premises you are using are not, uh, do not well support the conclusion, we call that a logical fallacy. And um, there are actually uh, tons of logical fallacies. You can search, um, even just pull up Google or some search engine and you type in logical fallacies and you'll find tons. Uh, in this textbook, we're only going to be focusing on 10. So there will be 10 logical fallacies we'll discuss and we're going to go through um, what the logical fallacy is. We'll look at some examples and we'll go from there. So um, I, I think I can type this one. Maybe, hopefully, maybe that will be a little bit better. I don't know, we'll, we'll try this out. We'll figure it out as we go along. So the, there are 10 common fallacies that we are looking at are fallacies. Uh, so fallacy is singular fallacies, plural. Uh, so let's go ahead and list, we'll list the 10 that we're going to be covering. Uh, and then we are going to go through each one individually, uh, look at what, what causes the fallacy, look at an example of the fallacy and then go to the next one. So the first one is, Oh, there we go. Uh, first one is appeal to popularity. Uh, second is false cause. Third is appeal to ignorance. Uh, fourth is hasty generalization. The fifth is limited choice, which is sometimes called the false dilemma. Uh, sixth is circular reasoning. Seventh is personal attack. I think I skipped one. Yeah, uh, sorry, six is not circular reasoning. Six is appeal to emotion. Eight is circular reasoning. Okay, uh, nine is diversion, which is sometimes called the red herring fallacy. And 10 is the straw man. Okay, so these are the 10 fallacies that we're going to be looking at in this course. Again, there's more than more than these. Um, a fallacy receives its name when it's, uh, when it's so common that it just appears uh, very often in, in several different arguments. But you see it over and over again. Um, you don't necessarily have to remember this order. I think, I think what I might do for the exam is have this as kind of a uh, matching an argument with the fallacy. So I'll give you some arguments and then you'll pick from the list of fallacies which, which fallacy is being used in that argument. I think that's what we'll do for the, for the exam. Um, and so the, the fallacies, this is just the order where uh, approaching them, you don't have to memorize this order. You just have to be aware of what is the fallacy, uh, what is this, what is the structure of the fallacy, what what uh, causes the fallacy to occur, what is the uh, problem in the reasoning, and possibly come up with an example or identify an argument using that fallacy. Okay, so let's look at the first one. So the first one that we're going to be looking at here is appeal to popularity. So we're looking at the appeal to popularity fallacy. And what occurs here? So the structure of this, uh, we're using the fact or I guess uh, I should phrase that differently. The fact that large numbers uh, 
of people believe or act in a way is used as evidence I'm going to underline that because that is the important part of that sentence is used as evidence that the belief or act is correct. Okay, so remember that as evidence, that means it's going to appear as a premise. So we're using the fact that a large number of people believe something or act in a certain way is used as evidence that that belief or that action is correct. That is the appeal to popularity fallacy. And I'm going to need a new page here. Uh, yeah, we're going to look at an example next. I just needed a, a fresh page since I was out of room. Um, so let's look at an example for that. So here's an example. Uh, this example is actually uh, probably hasn't been true for several centuries, but I like it. So we're going to use it anyways. Uh, example, everyone. <laughs> actually, that is the exact example I am using. Yeah. Everyone believes The earth is flat. So the earth must be flat. OK, so here is an argument. Again, uh, the first thing that we want to do is we want to look at this argument and identify what is the uh, premise or premises, what is the conclusion. Um, now there, there are different ways of going about that. I think, at least for me personally, it's easier to identify what is the conclusion first. So uh, remember, the conclusion is what is being argued, and the premise is what we are using as evidence for that statement. So here, uh, what is the conclusion? And I think somebody already is ahead of me in chat with that. Yes. The conclusion is the earth must be flat. This is our conclusion. And what are we using as evidence for that conclusion? Everyone believes that the earth is flat. That's what we're using as our premise. That's our evidence. It's going to say that is our premise. And so again, we can restructure this. I'm going to do this for this example. We can write our premise first. In this case, we have premise one is everyone believes the earth is flat. And our conclusion to that since we are using that as evidence, our conclusion, uh, and I did not spell that correctly, conclusion, there we go, is <laughs> the earth is flat. Okay. Oops. So again, here, um, I have a couple of things I want to mention. The first thing is that the what we're using as evidence, notice what are we using as evidence that the Earth is flat in this argument? We're using as evidence that everyone believes that it is so. And again, this is several centuries old. So that is not evidence that that statement is true. It's also not evidence that the statement is false. Um, so. But the uh, second thing I wanted to mention was um, a conclusion can be true and you can still be using 
a fallacy. It's in this case, what you are using as evidence. So if you are using the, uh, the fact that a large number of people believe something as evidence, then that is the uh, appeal to popularity fallacy, because that is not evidence or that is not valid evidence for, for something. Um, and so again, even if the conclusion is true, the fallacy can still be committed. So uh, another example, a secondary example would be something like everyone believes the sky is blue, therefore the sky is blue. We're using as evidence there that everyone believes the sky is blue. Again, if everyone believes something or everyone does something, that does not mean that that thing is correct. So we can't use that as evidence. So using that as evidence is an appeal to popularity. Okay, any questions on this first example? <laughs> okay, looks like, uh, looks like you guys are a little bit in a mood today, that's all right. Okay, and I'm not seeing any questions, but I will keep my eye on chat again. I know there's a little bit of a delay. So let's look at the second one. Uh, that is a good question. What would be evidence that the sky is blue? Um, that might depend on who you ask. I would probably say uh, using something to measure the wavelength. Uh, would be, and that that wavelength matches with what we call blue, then I would, I would say that that is sufficient evidence. Um, the conclusion can sometimes appear first in, our, in an argument, yes, uh, because English is weird like that. Um, so you have to be careful when you are analyzing these. Um, I, think, I think we'll have an example or two where that will be the case, but uh, we can always, so uh, just to reiterate that, we can always write, uh, Re rewrite an argument where we have the premises first and the conclusion last. But uh, with just the way that the English language is, and I think most other languages are, uh, the conclusion can not only appear at the beginning of the argument, but can also sometimes appear in the middle of the argument. Uh, so you do have to be careful when you are analyzing something. Okay, two. Oh, and um, also one more thing. Uh, when you are reading through the textbook for this section, uh, you'll see in the margins um, of, the, of the textbook that there are some images that, uh, that summarize the fallacy. And so for people that are more visual, that might be a good visual aid to use when you are studying. And it also has a nice uh, summary as well. So uh, when you're reading the textbook, um, pay close attention, at least in section 1A, in the margin. So, okay. Um, second one is, that we're going to look at is the false cause. Very good. Yep. So, um, Kevin there wrote the arg rewrote the argument where the conclusion appears first. Uh, false cause fallacy. So let's look at the false cause fallacy. All right, so for the false cause fallacy, we're using the fact that one event came before another is used as evidence that the first event hmm, 
Mm -hmm. Push the wrong button there. That the first event caused the second. So here, uh, for the false cause fallacy, what we are using as evidence, and, and again, notice we have that as evidence, so that's going to be as a premise in our argument, we're using the fact that event A happened before event B to conclude that event A must have caused event B. That is the false cause fallacy. So let's look at an example. Okay, example, uh, this one is kind of fun, but it's all right. Um, also, one more thing while I'm, while I'm thinking about it. Uh, I do at times try to use different examples than what the book uses so that you can get a wide range of, of examples, um, which is another, another uh, reason to uh, read through the textbook as well, um, because for some of those, not all, but for some of those, I will use different examples than what the book uses. So when you read through the textbook, you'll get uh, more examples. And again, that's not for every single one. If I had the time, I definitely would. Um, okay, so let's look at this argument. Uh, so this argument is, every time that I wash my car, It rains the next day. Today, I washed my car. So it will, let's put a comma there. So it will rain tomorrow. So this is the argument that is given. Uh, again, let's identify the premise and the conclusion. Um, let's start with the conclusion. And uh, for this example, I'm not going to write, uh, rewrite it as premise, 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 conclusion. Um, but you should be able to do that as well. Um, uh, that is a good question. Uh, I would say that that is a superstition. Uh, you'll notice that a lot of superstitions actually come from fallacies, or a lot of fallacies were found by looking at superstitions. So again, um, fallacies are things that occur often enough to, or at least the ones that have names, is a as a problem in the argument that uh, appears often enough that it has has a name. And again, let's uh, let's remember to be to be professional in the chat. This is a classroom, so okay. Uh, so for this argument, what what is the conclusion? Let's start with that. The conclusion. What is the conclusion to this argument? Any brave souls want to answer that question? It will rain tomorrow. Excellent. Yes, that is the conclusion. It will rain tomorrow. That is what we are arguing. That is what we are trying to convince the other person or persons uh, that that will be true. So then what are we doing? Uh, what are we using as evidence? What is our what is our premise or premises? Again, any brave souls? That every time he wash there, the, the person washes their car, it rains. Good. Every time that you wash, that I wash my car, it rains. So that's one premise. So let's label that as premise one. And then the other piece of evidence is today I washed my car. So that is premise two. Now you could, if you wanted to, combine those as a single premise. Um, but in this case, we can write it as two. So that's fine. Uh, so notice here we're using as evidence that event A occurs before event B. Uh, so that is a false cause fallacy. Um, the fact that an event 
uh, that event A occurs before event B does not mean all the time that event A causes event B to occur. All right. Good. Um, and if you have any questions on that one, let me know. Um, I'm keeping my eye on chat. If not, I will continue to the next one. So the third one we're going to look at is appeal to ignorance. And what we use with this fallacy is uh, there is no evidence. Or let's see, how, how should we phrase this? There is no evidence that some statement P is true, or we could also say, or is false. Therefore, P is, and my program is freezing up here. It's all right, is false, or on the other side, or is true. So this fallacy comes in two different flavors, uh, which are pretty much similar. But uh, the first one is, there is no evidence that P is true, therefore it is false. Or you could also have the appeal to ignorance be, there is no evidence that P is false, Therefore, P is true. Uh, here, you are using as evidence, uh, you're using as a premise that there is no evidence of something. All right, so let's look at an example for that. Let me get a, a fresh page here. Uh, assuming, yeah, that would be, I think that would be an accurate way to frame that. So let's look at an example. Uh, so this example we have found no evidence. of intelligent uh -huh. intelligent life outside of earth all right <laughs> let me fix that sorry of earth there we go uh therefore There is intelligent life only on Earth. Okay. So again, when we're looking at evaluating an argument, and this might, might become second nature uh, when you do enough of these examples, the first thing we want to do is identify what is our conclusion, what is our premise or premises. And I always like to start, excuse me, I always like to start with the conclusion because I think that is easier. Um, but if you want to start with, the, with identifying the premises, that's fine. Uh, but for, for now, for this argument, what is the conclusion here for this argument? There's no intelligent life, only on Earth. 
Exactly right. Yep. That there is no intelligent life except on Earth, or the only intelligent life there is is on Earth. So that is our conclusion. And you'll notice when you go through some of these examples that there is a a few words that will stand out. Um, therefore, is usually the word that uh, that comes before the conclusion. So usually it's uh, something, therefore, conclusion. So that's a nice keyword there. And what we are using as evidence is there is a lack of evidence. We have found no evidence of intelligent life outside of Earth. There's a lack of evidence of intelligent life that is not on Earth. So there must not be intelligent life outside of Earth. So here we're using, again, we're using as uh, we're using a lack of evidence as our premise. And that is a logical fallacy. That is the appeal to ignorance. So a lack of evidence is not, uh, does not well support the conclusion. Um, no, the, the uh, appeal to ignorance fallacy is specifically that you're using there is no evidence. So um, uh, when, you are, when you are looking at these arguments, this one, uh, there, there must be no evidence either one way or the other that a statement is true or false. Um, there is actually, with, uh, to answer your question, if there is evidence but not convincing enough, that is actually our next one, which is hasty generalization. So they are related, uh, but they are quite different. Um, so there, there was a question that I, I'm not sure if that was posted publicly or just me, but there was a question about if what if there is evidence, but it's not convincing enough. Um, and the answer to that is, well, that's actually our next fallacy. Uh, but that is a good question. Uh, OK. So let's look at our next fallacy then, which is hasty generalization. And hasty generalization then, as I said, which was the answer to this question. Oh, no, no, that's fine. Uh, you can go either way. I just want to make sure that if, if you do, uh, that I repeat the uh, question so that the class knows what, what question I'm answering. Uh, but that's perfectly fine if you want to message direct, that's fine. Um, so four, we're looking at appeal to ignorance. The appeal to ignorance. Isn't that what we just did? Now we're supposed to do hasty generalization. Oh yes, sorry, thank you. <laughs> hasty generalization. Thank you very much. Okay, good. That would be um, minus two points for me. <laughs> okay, hasty generalization. Okay, hasty generalization fallacy. Generalization, let me make sure I spell this correctly. Fallacy. Um, so as I stated, this is, this is when uh, so I'll, I'll say it first, and then we'll we'll rewrite it, uh, write it down for our notes. Uh, a conclusion is drawn from an in, inadequate number of cases, or from uh, cases that are that have not been sufficiently analyzed. Uh, so here there is um, not enough evidence, or uh, the things that we have for evidence have not been analyzed thoroughly enough um, to really say anything about the conclusion. Uh, so let's write that down for our notes. A conclusion, as soon as my program decides to work. Okay, conclusion is drawn from inadequate number of cases. So we don't have enough evidence or from cases not sufficiently analyzed. So we have some cases that we are looking at that we think 
would be evidence for the conclusion, but we have not analyzed it uh, with enough detail to come to that conclusion. Uh, so let's look at a, an example. I think this example was one that I that I am borrowing from the book because I like the the example the book had. All right. So the example for this argument: two cases of childhood leukemia. Uh, let's see if I know how to spell that, leukemia. Have occurred. Along streets. With high voltage power lines. Ah, uh, yeah, I apologize for that. Um, so the conclusion is, so the power lines caused the leukemia. And this one, I think I already gave away what the conclusion was. So here, our conclusion is that the power lines are what is uh, causing the leukemia. And so uh, that is our conclusion. Wouldn't this week also consider a false cause policy? Um, I think you could argue that, yes. Um, I think you could you could classify this as a false cause. Uh, well, I guess um, to to make it a little bit more clear. Um, just for the sake of this course, uh, if this if the if the children had moved into the neighborhood prior, and then had gotten the leukemia, then I would say that would be false cause. Um, but in this case, because we're just saying there are two cases in this area with high voltage power lines, therefore the high voltage power lines are causing it, we'll, we'll say that's a hasty generalization because there could be other reasons for that occurring. It could be, there could be, uh, take for example, contaminated water, uh, well, uh, very large number of, of things that could occur. And let's see, there was another question. Uh, stereotypes, yes. Uh, so the question is, would stereotypes be considered hasty generalization? And the answer is yes. Um, so stereotypes, you are taking uh, a lack of information or um, very little information to come to a conclusion. Uh, that's, I guess, just what stereotypes are. And so stereotypes, all stereotypes would be a hasty generalization fallacy. Yes. Good. Very good. Uh, so this is our premise. Very good. All right. Getting some, some good things from chat. Excellent. Um, any questions so far up to this point? on any of the examples or any of the fallacies so far. OK. Um, again, I'll keep my eye on chat because you might be still typing. Uh, but if not, we will continue. So five is limited choice. Uh, the limited choice fallacy. Again, sometimes this is called the false dilemma fallacy. 
And the way that this fallacy works is uh, one artificially, yep, and sorry, my program froze a little bit. So let me clean that up artificially. precludes choices that should be considered. So uh, again, we'll look at an example which will clear this up. Um, but in general, for, for this type of fallacy looking at um, the person making the argument says that either A or B has to be true, when in fact there might be an option C, D, E, so on. And so the person making the argument either um, subconsciously or consciously is saying, well, there, there are only these choices, A and B, whereas in fact there is a, at least a third option C, probably more than that. Uh, so let's look at an example for this particular fallacy. Okay. And I think this one came from the book as well. I'll try to point that out so that um, you can look up uh, the extra examples if you would like. Uh, this, this argument goes as follows. You don't support the president so whoop, so you are not patriotic So this is our argument. Again, let's identify what is the conclusion? What is the premise? Let's start with the conclusion. What is the conclusion for this argument? You are not patriotic. Exactly right. That is the conclusion. The conclusion is you are not patriotic. So that is our conclusion. Notice in this argument, we actually only have a one, one sentence. And we have our premise and argument, or sorry, our premise and conclusion in there. So the premise is that you don't support the president. So notice the person making this argument says either you support the president and you're patriotic, or you don't support the president and you are not patriotic. But that is not the only possible choices. You can be patriotic and not support the president. It is also possible that you are not patriotic and do support the president. So notice in that case, there are actually uh, four choices that could occur. Whereas this, the person making this argument is, is breaking it down into there's only these two choices. Either you are, you are patriotic and support the president or you are not patriotic and you do not support the president. And again, those are not the only two choices. So that's why we call this the limited choice fallacy. Uh, and let's get a new page. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit more. Whoops. Okay. Uh, let's see, where are we at here? Number six. Appeal to emotion. All right, so the appeal to emotion fallacy uh, let's let's just write this down. Um, 
So something is associated with a positive, or we could also say or negative. So again, this one will come in two different flavors. Uh, positive or negative emotion. Uh, we'll say emotional response. Therefore, it must be true, or in this case, or false, if it's associated with a negative emotional response. Um, Uh, would fear be an example of negative emotional response? Uh, yes, I would. I would say yes. All right, and I do want to make one note here. Uh, this you don't have to remember. This one, this I'm going to write in red because I'm not going to include it on the exam. Um, but the negative versions, when you're looking at the, oh, let me change the color there. Does intuition, that is a good question. Does intuition fall into this category? Um, I would say yes. Intuition will fall into this category as well. All right, the note that I want to make here, again, this is in red because I'm not going to test on it. The negative version. So um, something is associated with a negative emotional response, therefore it must be false. So the negative version and again, my program is freezing up. Sorry, I'm going to try and find a better program for next class. Uh, negative version is sometimes called uh, appeal to force. So you might see that in other textbooks or possibly online, uh, that they split this into two separate ones where they say the, uh, the positive one is appealed to emotion and the negative one is appealed to force. Uh, but I don't think that there's any reason to separate the two, especially since here we're not really going into too much depth. We just want to be able to recognize the fallacies. So let's look at an example for this. So here, the example that I want to look at is the world would be a better place if magic existed, therefore, magic must exist. Okay. So for this example, the conclusion is that magic must exist. And what we are using for that is the world would be better, uh, would be a better place if it existed, that magic is associated with a positive emotional response. We're using that emotion as evidence that it must exist. And so that is the fallacy here. Uh, you cannot use emotion as evidence. Um, So that's the appeal to emotion fallacy. And again, just be aware, it is not always uh, sometimes the negative version. The uh, If it's a negative emotional response, sometimes it's called appeal to force, which uh, actually might be why the why fear 
would be because fear would be a negative emotion. So that that would be uh, probably classified as a pill to force. But again, in this course, we're just going to we're just going to classify that as a pill to emotion. Um, we don't want to get too deep into the into the water here. Okay, seven is personal attack, the personal attack fallacy. Sometimes that is called uh, the ad hominem fallacy. Um, that is that is a good question. Um, we will be doing some argument analysis in section one uh, D, I believe that is. I'll have to double check my notes. I think so. I think we're skipping one B. Uh, and one C is on sets, which is a little bit of a of a tangent. But then we'll be applying the set uh, stuff to analyze arguments. Um, so there will be some uh, some some of that. Uh, yes, in later sections. I lost my mouse. There we are. Okay. Uh, personal attack. Uh huh. And actually, um, well, no, I, I don't think that would be a true statement. Let's, let's not say that. OK. Personal attack fallacy. Uh, so in this fallacy, the person making the argument has a problem with a person or a group claiming a statement. Uh, therefore, that statement is not true. So um, the way the book phrases this, I have a problem with a person or group claiming some statement, oops, should be an M, claiming uh, some statement P. Therefore, the statement P is not true. So an example of this. Let's see. Uh, let's go with this example. Bob says, I should stop smoking to improve my health. But Bob smokes all the time. So quitting will not make a significant difference. OK. So for this argument, what is our conclusion? It will not make a significant difference. Exactly right. That quitting will not make a significant difference in our health. So that is our conclusion. Our premise, uh, well, I, I, I think we could say we have two premises. Our first premise is that Bob says I should stop smoking to improve my health. And the second premise is Bob smokes all the time. 
Well, notice this is a personal attack fallacy. We have a problem with Bob saying I should stop smoking because he does it all the time. But that doesn't make his statement any less true or less false. So just because we have a problem with Bob claiming, in this case, we should stop smoking, even though that Bob does that, that does not make his statement any less true. So that is the personal attack fallacy. Very good. It sounds like the person's, um, Bob is hypocritical, but what he's saying may happen to be true. <laughs> exactly, yes, exactly. And that is, that is um, you'll find that oftentimes that is where this fallacy shows up is, uh, this is a personal attack on Bob, because Bob, in this case, I guess, is being hypocritical with his statement. But that doesn't make his statement any less true. So it is still a true statement that quitting smoking will improve your health. So um, there's our conclusion. I'll leave. Uh, well, no, let's go ahead and, and label those. So one premise is the statement that Bob makes. And the second premise is why we have a problem with Bob making that statement, premise two. Okay, uh, let's see. So we have uh, three fallacies left, uh, but let's go ahead and pick that up next class. So we didn't quite finish section 1A so uh, section 1A will not be due this weekend. I'm going to fix those, those due dates. Um, so what you should have uh, due this weekend, um, or what you should focus on this weekend, number one, uh, try to get your Pearson account set up. Um, one note on that, um, uh, Pearson does have a, a two-week grace period. Uh, I believe that's uh, 14 calendar days from the start of the semester where you can create an account and work on homework before you have to pay for the account. Um, so you can still work on homework. Um, so try and get your Pearson account set up and, and uh, linked with Web Campus. And the second thing that you should focus on is the academic integrity quiz uh, verification. Uh, so that's taking the place of the mini project for this week since we haven't really covered enough material to do a mini project quiz. Um, so those two things are what you should focus on. If you're not able to, again, that's, or not able to uh, link your Pearson account, that's fine, but it is definitely something you should do. Um, there is one more thing I wanted to say before I ask for questions. Um, I believe that Pearson is going to have uh, some uh, tutoring available for, for the, uh, the next week or so. Um, to help you set up your account. So I'm going to post that information on Web Campus tonight. Uh, so you can uh, get in contact with them um, if you're having some issues. Um, but I believe that is going on for this week, I think part of next week. I'll, I'll post that information on Web Campus tonight. Um, either, well, probably through an announcement and also uh, as a page on the module. Okay, so with that, uh, are there any any questions before I let you guys go? Uh, yeah. Um, so for the homework assignments we were talking about before the class started, they're going to be due next next weekend. Yes. Yep. Okay. So um, the way that I usually try to set this up is anything that we finish the lecture on will be due that weekend. Well, we haven't finished the lecture on one A, so that is not going to be due this weekend. So we need okay. to definitely fix those those due dates. Right. Uh, there was another question in the chat. When do I upload lectures? I try to upload lectures the same day. So I am going to try and upload that. It depends on my internet connection, um, but that should be uploaded, if not tonight, at the latest by tomorrow. Um, Another question there. Yeah, so the, the, first, the first, I guess the um, theme one project, the main project, for the first third of the class will be a group project. And what we'll do is we'll all, all separate the class into groups on web campus. And you'll have your own personal page there so you can communicate with your group members either through web campus or 
exchange contact information, you have a better way of connecting. Um, I think some, some uh, what, what is it that they like to use? Discord, I think was mentioned for some students. Some other students use Zoom, uh, Zoom calls, things like that. But uh, there will also be, there should be some, some class time available for the group project. In which case we will, I will split the, uh, split the class here. We'll do breakout rooms and I'll put you into the, the groups there. Um, but more information on that will come uh, as it gets closer. Uh, any other questions? I, I just wanted to clarify something that the homework and the reading checks and that sort of thing won't be due to, for another week on the uh, section 1A. That is correct. Yep. So we didn't finish 1A today. So it's not going to be due this weekend. Um, you could probably get a decent amount of it done if you wanted to get a head start, but it won't be due this weekend. It will be due uh, next weekend, next Sunday. Yeah, so not this Sunday. I don't have set up yet. So yeah, okay. I had Pearson last semester, but it expired at the end of the semester for the 95. And oh, I don't know if okay, yeah. the same textbook that they use in the 120 or not. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I, um, but even if I got the text, sure I still need to get all the the homework and stuff. So, but I, right. I'm the one that's telling you I didn't didn't have the money yet. So that's why. Oh, I didn't that's right. That's that. right. Yep. So, um, so yeah, there won't there won't be any any homework due on Pearson this weekend. But we do need to do that integrity thing. Yep, yeah, and that is on Web Campus. Okay, and what what does that cover? Just what you said in the syllabus? Uh, yeah, so if I remember correctly, I should probably just double check this. Um, is it just goes through, it goes through what the uh, integrity policy is, academic integrity policy is. And at the end, it's, um, I agree to follow the integrity policy for UNLV. Oh, and so that's basically what your, what and, your quiz is. Yeah, yeah, that's you basically what to, the quiz is. You don't have to know ahead of time what that is. You just have no. to click yep. on it, read it, agree, and you're done. Pretty much. Yep. That's it. Okay. That's the, thanks for clarifying that. Cause I was kind of confused on what that was. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess, um, I don't know if I should call it a quiz, but I like to try to give opportunity for points. And I think having it in the quiz category just gives you some extra points in case some quizzes go, uh, go poorly in the future. Okay, um, any other questions? Okay, um, so if there are no other questions, we'll go ahead and end there for today. Um, hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. Again, try to get your Pearson set up if you can. I will be posting that information um, from Pearson on their, on their tutoring sessions that will be available this week uh, and, then, and do the academic integrity quiz. And I will see you then on, um, let's see, what is today? Thir yeah, on Tuesday, uh, unless you come to office hours tonight. So um, thank you very much. And I will, I'm gonna stop the recording here. I do see that there's some private questions. So I will stick around a little bit for those questions, but I'm gonna stop the recording here. Uh, and let me, let me stop that so I can see better. Where's the recording button? There it is.